Hi, I'm Kathy Vaness. Um, I'm the general manager of the Golden Door, and I'm so excited tonight to be sitting here with someone I've wanted to interview for almost two years oh. and get her to come back to the Golden Door, Gail Sheehy. <laughs> We're going to have some fun because our interview is going to be a little bit about her tonight. You know, she's talked about lots of things in generations, and tonight we're going to learn a little bit about her and some of her incredible perspectives about life. Journalist and author Gail Sheehy has taken readers into the minds and hearts of countless important figures. Throughout her career, she's written in-depth character portraits of Hillary Clinton, Michelle Gorbachev, Margaret Thatcher, among others. Her influential 1976 bestseller, Passages, examined the predictable crisis people experience as they age. And follow-ups like The Silent Passage, Menopause, Understanding, Men's Passage, and continue to map how people change as time goes on. But in her latest book, which we have here with us tonight, Daring, My Passages, she he turns inward, I get kind of goosebumps about this, reflecting on her own life's journey and it's a great story. In her 50 years as a writer, she's interviewed thousands of women and men, written 17 books. Her earliest revolutionary book, Passages, remained on the New York Times bestseller for three years. And as I mentioned, was, as she mentioned, was named one of the top 10 most influential books of all time. You dared to walk, you know this line, you dared to walk the streets of New York City with hook, you know this, I know you and hookers and pimps to expose violent prostitution, to march with civil rights protesters in Northern Ireland as British paratroopers opened fire, to seek out Egypt's President Anwar Sadat as he was targeted for death after making peace with Israel. How did you get this bravery? Well, I, I, I find it took me three years as I was writing this memoir to figure that out. And um, what was the theme of my life? And I realized that it was daring, but the reason I dare is to overcome my fears. When I fear, I dare. And I started doing that rather early in childhood, and, um, and it, you know, I fail oftentimes, but, but failing, but maybe getting halfway there or getting a little encouragement from a coach or from my mom or something would encourage me to try to do it again, and then if I would master it after a few times, then I'd feel really good that I dared, and I got over my fear. Um, so it's not that I'm like some you know fearless daredevil and was gonna do everything all the time. I have just the normal fears that we all do. I've had a panic attack or two in my life, but this was the way I found around it, was to dare. And, um, and some of the biggest dares in my life were very interior ones that happened very late in my life. So, um, I, you know, so what is daring? I mean, a lot of people wonder. <clears throat> well, it, the simplest thing is it's the courage to take the less traveled road. You've all heard that um, uh, saying. Um, but it's also um, the courage to, to fail and get up again and try it again and again until you either move on to something else or master it. Um, it's the courage to speak out for someone who has no voice uh, or you know is shunned. Um, it's the courage to um, cross a gender barrier. Haven't you all done that? Cross a gender barrier, cross a color barrier, cross an age barrier, and just sit down as if you belong there. And it changes the way people react to you. You know, daring does change the response that you get. It changes the conditions, and then the response you get gives you more courage and makes you feel more natural and more connected and more accepted. It is a, it's a, you know, uh, um, a, a reflexive process. So you, you once said, I'll probably never see the Taj Mahal or climb Mount Everest, but I still maybe can influence people's ways of thinking by a story that I can share. Do you have a favorite story? Um, yes, I actually do. Um, I, okay, so this is, this was one of my early dares in my early career. <clears throat> I was working for the New York Herald Tribune which was a very famous uh, competitor to the New York Times back in the 
in the 60s. And, um, and I was working in the women's department, sequestered in the women's department because that's where girl journalists had to work. You could not cross the, you know, the, into the testosterone zone of the city room because that was all for men who wore white shirts and black ties. And, um, well, it was, I got pretty bored up there. So I decided one day that there was this guy down, to, down in the city room who was putting out something called New York Magazine. But it was just New York. It was the Sunday supplement of the Herald Tribune. And it was all stories, long, fascinating feature stories and reviews. So I thought, I'm just going to go down and see if I can talk to the editor. So I got my courage up and I walked down the back stairs so my boss lady wouldn't catch me in the elevator, taking my best story to this man who was, you know, running this fabulous, incubating New York Magazine. So I get down, I cross through the, you know, all these guys are looking like, and I get to the door and I hear, um, there's Clay Ferkel, and he's on the phone and he's saying, what do you mean you don't have my reservation? Isn't this the Four Seasons? It's Clay Felker. I want my usual table in the pool room. I'm bringing a senator, and my wife's opening on Broadway tonight. I'm thinking, oh, I'm going to like pitch this man who knows everybody in New York. And I'm thinking, you know, I mean, my boyfriend at the time would call me a skinny, brainy chick, which was not a compliment <laughs> in those days. <laughs> so <clears throat> I get my courage up, and I say, Mr. Felker? And he says, where did you come from? Oh, the estrogen zone? <laughs> <laughs> said, oh my gosh. And he said, he laughed and he said, what have you got for me? And I said, oh, I know I have 30 seconds. And I said, well, it, you know, it's a story about loser guys who have a beach house on Fire Island and they're trying to attract beautiful girls to come and share their beach house and sit on their beach blanket and attract other beautiful girls because they can't. You know, it's kind of like flypaper. Um, and he said, did you? And I said, and they're having specimen viewing parties. He said, did you go to a specimen viewing party? I said, yes, they rejected me. He said, <laughs> he said great. Write it just like you told. Write it like a scene. We'll call it the flypaper people. Oh my gosh. Well, I thought, write journalism like a scene? I never heard of that. It was all who, what, when, where, why in those days. And so <clears throat> that was my jumping off point into working, writing the new journalism. So a year later, Clay takes the magazine, New York uh, Herald Tribune folds. Clay takes the magazine public. He has a big party at the Four Seasons. I can't go. I live on the Lower East Side in a fourth floor walk up with my two and a half year old child and <clears throat> husband who's always um, at the hospital because he's an intern. So late at night, I suddenly, I'm closing the window and I see this limousine pull up on East 7th Street. We didn't have li limousines there. And this man in black tie gets out. And all of a sudden, I hear that my lookout, a Ukrainian seamstress on the first floor, she calls up and says, a fancy man wants coming up. <laughs> <laughs> OK? And I said, OK. So in walks Clay, bursts in, and he said, well, where were you tonight? Why weren't you at the Four Seasons? And I said, well, I mean, I don't, I don't have a babysitter. I, I don't, you know, my husband's at the hospital. I don't have a gown. And he said, Gail, listen, I want you to go out and, oh, he said, I know what he said. He said, um, what do you know about politics? I said, well, I mean, my mother's a natural born Irish bomb throwing, um, you know, person. And my father's a, a country club Republican. So I know about politics. It's about fighting at the dinner table. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> he said, great, then you'll understand Bobby. Oh, Bobby who? Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy? He said, yes, I want you to go out and cover his political campaign, his presidential campaign against Gene McCarthy in California and Oregon. I said, me? I've never written a political story. And he said, Gail, you never make your name as a, as a writer, just writing nice little stories for the women's department. No matter how good they are, <clears throat> people aren't going to remember them. You have to write about something everybody's talking about, but nobody knows the why. That was really good advice. And so I went. I took my fear in my mouth and said, OK, I'm going to dare to do this, and we'll see what happens. And the next thing you know, um, I'm in Oregon, and it's a rainy, horrible, squally day. And the senator is going to take a tiny little plane up and down the Cascade Mountains um, 
to you know see or all the rural people in Oregon. Well, none of the big time journalists wanted to go, so I get a seat. There's only like eight of us in the plane, and all of a sudden I'm on the plane and I hear, "Would you like to sit up here, New York?" I said, what? That's me. And so I'm sitting next to Bobby Kennedy, and this beautiful, lovely thing happens. He asks his an aide to bring him JFK's overcoat, his brother's overcoat. It was you know, five years since Kennedy, President Kennedy, had been assassinated, and Bobby Kennedy was still wearing his brother's clothes. Mm -hmm. So it was a very poignant moment. It led us to talk about his family and about many tragedies in his family. And then we'd get off and stop in these rural places, and he'd be greeted by these shaggy bearded guys with, you know, a rifle over one shoulder, and I swear a, a raccoon or a possum on the other shoulder. <laughs> And you know he'd just walk right through them, go on, stand on the courthouse steps without really any protection in those days. And then he'd try to talk, to engage them in conversation about limiting the spread of guns. You can imagine how popular that subject was in that setting. But he would continue to do that, and burg after burg. I thought, you know, that's courage. Uh, and we get back on the plane at the end of the day, and it's even worse weather. And we're flying through, bumping around, and all of a sudden, we can't see this, but another plane is heading straight at us. And our plane drops like a stone, like 60 feet. And the guys are screaming, my stomach is turning over. And Bobby Kennedy quips in the middle of it. I knew Gene McCarthy was desperate. I didn't know he was that desperate. <laughs> well, that gave me an insight that I never would have had if I hadn't gone on that trip because what it told me was, this man was a fatalist. He'd had so much tragedy and loss in his life. And he knew when he was, you know, prancing around to talking about spreading, you know, limiting the spread of guns and talking about, you know, the underclass, that he was a target. And he did it anyway. And two nights later, his own life was ended at the point of a gun. So, um, that, that story mattered, you know, yeah, and it wouldn't have. That's an amazing story. And, and I, it is an amazing, amazing story. When I think of that, I was in that moment of history, uh, and that way awakened an appetite. So I managed to get into a lot of other moments of history. Oh my gosh. Well, I want to ask you a little bit about your groundbreaking work in New Passages. You know, I, you, I think this is the perfect book for this audience, and probably for a lot of audience, obviously, the bestseller. But it talks about how do you customize your life cycles? And this, customize your life I want you to, Can you explain that to our guests? I thought was, and there's a couple questions here. I, I want to just repeat a couple more because you're going to go to a big thing. I want to get them in the mindset. The idea about stopping and recalculating your life the day you turn 45 is an infancy and a new start of life. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, second adulthood. Second adulthood. Yeah. I think this is, our, especially for baby boomers in this generation that has so much left to give. Talk, let's talk a little about that. Well, you know, the, and you know, there's a third adulthood for baby boomers who are in their 60s and 70s, and what what I hear a lot is from their from millennial millennials saying, you know, I keep having these women calling me up, and they're like, these are millennials who are working for nonprofits and various kinds of you know community organizations and so on. They say these women are calling me up. They're seven years old. They want they're activists. They're really good activists, and they they want to you know get out there in the field and do work, and they are, as you know. They're not retiring, most of them. They are very, very active. I agree. I think there's a whole, but do some people, are some people afraid to get out there and maybe try? Is there, is there, are there the people who just, it just happens automatically and they just keep going, they have so much energy and there's just some that are afraid? You know, I, I, I went, I might have thought so, but I was on the Women's March in Washington, and that was, I've been on a lot of marches, but I must say that that one really touched me more than almost anyone because there were, there were girls there 14 and 16, not even necessarily with their mothers or with their older sister. And there were, you know, there were women in wheelchairs, there were women with canes, there were women with, you know, all ages and sizes. And the sense of solidarity, the sense of, you know, I know we are not a monolith. How could you possibly be with all the individuals there are among women and men? But 
that day, we were a monolith. There was a monolithic feeling about it, and there was no violence, there was no interruption, there was no shoving, there was no bitching because it was too hot and you couldn't move and, you know, and all of that. Half of us didn't even hear the speeches because, you know, we came from the other direction and we were behind the stage, but it didn't matter mm -hmm. because the sense of, you know, being there together. So, uh, and I think that that is, that is going to revive our politics in this time of great distress. I want to give you a quote of your own that I sort of love. I have a couple of them, if you don't mind. One is, if every day is an awakening, you will never grow old. You will just keep growing. What was your awakening? Your very own. Well, I have had many awakenings. I had an interesting awakening just the other day. I, I went on a, a day's retreat with my, uh, the women of my church, and uh, we were doing a walking meditation. And I, they said, <clears throat> the instruction was, try to just focus on something really simple, like the articulation of your foot. You know, put down the heel, feel the center, feel the, your, your toes, and just think about the articulation of your foot and the movement that you're allowed to make and how long you can make it and so on. So I actually did that. And for once, my you know, monkey mind didn't take over. I was really doing that, I was enjoying it. And I was realizing that, I finally realized that I wasn't worried about whether I was keeping up with younger people. I was going at my own pace and it felt, I felt totally balanced, as if I was doing Tai Chi. So that's lovely. And then we come back, we're on the way back, and all of a sudden from that minuscule, very personal, um, periscope, my world opened up and suddenly I think I felt like God spoke to me and said, I mean, you have many more years to go for your grandchildren. That is your purpose. Wow, that's an awakening. And I thought, and then I started to calculate. I said, well, okay, well, one is nine, one is 12, one is 16. And I want to be able to see each one of them start college, so that means I have to live till I'm 89. You will. Look at you, you look great. I want to give you another quote. Okay. If we don't change, we don't grow. If we don't grow, we're not really living. We're not really living. How many of you feel like that? Yeah, I mean, haven't you been in that place where you're not growing, where you're just kind of stuck? and then you suddenly, you, you realize it at some point, and that's the time to be daring. That's the time to get out of your comfort zone and you know, do something that you wouldn't have attempted before. And it just, you know, it gets everything going. I mean, I learned this really in terms of health when my husband got cancer and then we had radical surgery and he got over that first one. Then he had a second one a few years later, which was lymphoma. And it wasn't serious, it was contained and indolent and da da da. And the doctor said, well, I'm not gonna give you any treatment because nothing I do is going to really prolong your life at this point. We said, oh, you're gonna give up on us? And he said, no, no. I said, what I, my prescription for you is go out and do something you would never have done before this crisis and do it together. We changed our lives. We totally changed our lives. It took a year to figure it out, but we then changed our lives. And what I learned from that was the discomfort of it, the excitement of it, the fear of it, the anticipation of it. All of those things really made us grow. And by the time we got to move from New York to Berkeley, California to start a new life, we were in love again. We were young again. We were, you know, jogging around, uh, you know, a, a, a hill overlooking the Pacific. It was fantastic. And so I'm not saying that there wasn't a lot of scary stuff in there. And, you know, are we giving up our New York life forever? And will we ever see our grandchildren and all that? But it was, it was the best thing we could have done. And even though those 10 years that we were there, he had cancer again, and recovered again, and then ultimately we had to, he had to retire. They were 10 of our best years. 
because we were growing and we were out of our comfort zone and everything was fresh and new. Oh my goodness. You know, you've written so many books about the generations and the various stages of life, but what was it like to write your own story that was really tapping into you? It's quite really personal. hard. Right? Tell us about that. Really hard. Well, as I, you know, being a journalist, I'm always reporting on other people and even being writing books, I'm always writing other people's stories. You, though some of you who have seen me here, you can't sit down with me at a table or I start interviewing you. You can't get away. So um, just to interview myself. So I, after the first six months, I said, I don't know how to do this. This is a whole other form of writing. This is not like anything I've ever done. I need to go back to school. So I, you know, one of the best memoirs is, um, his name has escaped me at this moment anyway. I took his class and it was so good that I took it again. And the feedback that you got from other memoirs uh, was very, very important. Um, and then, and he used to, and he was terrible, he was so mean to me. He kept saying, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna push you to the wall because I know you can do this. And he said, you know, there's two people trying to write this book. There's Gail the journalist and then there's Gail the, the internal Gale, the writer, the person who feels, which one do you think I'd like to kill off? So he forced me to do. That's brilliant though. Yeah. Because you, you could see things into, you might not have even seen into yourself. Well, it was, it, and that's why I actually recommend everybody write a memoir. If it's only for your own family, because those grandchildren um, and other relatives will want to know more about you from the inside things that you may never have told them or may never have told yourself. That's what's amazing about it. It kind of, you know, you actually see what the through line of your life is. And I think then you can forgive yourself for things and, you know, put things in perspective because you're good, you know, you're all good. I know you're good. And we often don't give ourselves enough credit for the good things that we've done. You're, you closed your book with this powerful comment. Whenever my dark threatens to overtake my light, I remember the mantra that has guided my life. Lean forward, shoot off the edge of the pool, and keep on swimming. Where did this come from? Well, it's I was a- very powerful line, I love it. I was a swimmer as a, as a child um, and started swimming, my parents, couldn't stop me from walking into the Long Island Sound. I had no fear of the water. And so they had to teach me how to swim when I was three years old and you know, pushing me back and forth. And so I loved the water and uh, I became a racer. And, but I was always little. And so I'm you know, five years old and I'm racing in the six year and unders and they're all boys. And <laughs> you know, dive into the water and hope that you don't dive into a jellyfish. And, um, so, and then the, my father was actually my coach, and I and I it wasn't him, but I thought it was thought of a, of it being him as the one who would actually shoot the gun, the gun at your back, and you'd hear this racing gun go off, and you'd go. So um, I, I I overcame my fear of competing with boys in those young years because I didn't always win, but sometimes I did. And later on, I got some medals, you know, when I was 16, and, and that felt really good. And this was before Title IX. This was before you all, you were younger, had, you know, well, naturally, girls will be doing the same kinds of sports as boys, and, and you can't discriminate, and so on. So luckily, my father was you know, a real good coach yeah. for me. And um, so I remember the thing of standing on the edge of the pool when in the middle of the summer, you go to Playland um, Amusement Park and they were, it was, these were the big county races and I was a breaststroker and you'd be on the roof. And one day I, I really goofed and the gun would go off and you'd jump and go in the water and you know, breaststroke, you, you're, you, know, you're, you don't come up until you're three thirds, two thirds of the way there and then you, you um, butterfly in. So I we set one full start, two full stars. Third full start, if you dive in before the gun, you're disqualified. 
So I dive in and I'm, you know, swimming and I can, I can see there's nobody around me. I'm so excited, I'm so excited. And then I hear all this yelling and shouting and screaming and it's my team and they're screaming for me and they're screaming for me, Gail, stop! <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear it. And uh, so I lost that race and, you know, so I, I thought, okay, you should never really listen to what <laughs> other people exactly. are saying or doing. <laughs> Um, so I had a lot of uh, good experiences about coming from that, uh, the, the swimming races. I love your project, Do You Dare? Is that going to be a book? Well, and there's I wonderful it was stories be a book. in there. Oh my gosh, of daring and bravery and courage. A lot of, I, uh, yeah, I had a daring project called the Sheehy Daring Project, and I had a website, and I invited people to send in their daring stories, and then said if they, you know, if, sounds interesting, I'll call you and we can uh, discuss it over the phone and I'll write it up and post it. So I got hundreds and hundreds of great stories and they were everything from a young woman who was 19 and she couldn't go back to college for her second year because her father lost his job in the recession and so she, um, instead of you know feeling bereft and hanging out in her, her little main fishing town and marrying the boy in high school, who always expected that she would, she decided she was going to learn see, see something of the world. So she f had a friend in Charleston, South Carolina, she could stay with. She went to the South to learn what the South was like, because she was from Maine, and she was a waitress, and she learned what the South was like was about structural racism. Mm -hmm. She was a waitress, and all the people in her restaurant were white, except for the dishwashers, who the customers never saw, because they were black. And so for the first time, the shock of structural racism. But then she made enough money to backpack for six months all over Europe by herself at 19. And, you know, sometimes wondering what she was doing, walking down the middle of a street, obviously just a student with a backpack, a woman alone at night, got over that. But the main thing that she discovered in Europe, sitting at cafe tables and talking with people, she had a several languages, there's this thing called patriarchy. Well, she'd never heard of patriarchy. She never knew, there was nobody who had ever used that word or introduced that concept. And the idea that it was not only in Europe, it was also back home. Yeah. So that was daring of her. And she learned so much about the world and she went back and did not settle down with a boy in Maine and went back to college and is now on her way to being a writer. Wow. And then the, there was a 75-year-old woman who I was at Rancho La Puerta when I did a focus group with um, people about daring. And her daring moment was to tell her husband of many years, who she loved, that she could not stand another day of being the caregiver for his mother who was a first class, <laughs> it rhymes with rich. And um, she, you know, had to commute to go back and forth to her and the woman was, you know, just inconsolable about aging and so on. And finally her husband just didn't pay any attention to her, just didn't, you know, well, I know it's tough, but I'm glad you're doing it. She had done it for five years and she finally said, if you don't take over, I'm leaving. I'm going to the. I'm going to go to the beach for a year. And she was ready. And she was packing up. And he realized that she actually meant it. That was daring. And it was freeing. Yes. And she then was able to even sort of make peace with the mother-in-law, and take her out for several martinis on the night that she had chosen to leave this earth. And then she the you know wife the, the freed wife went par paragliding just taking off into the wild blue yonder to celebrate her freedom what a way well that sort of leads me if you could use one word one of my favorite questions to describe yourself what is that word and it's only one mm. curious were you always curious as a child? Yes. Yeah, the, 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 and I knew that I was when, we, I lived in a suburb, 
And, you know, for, to, for, for a kid who likes writing and interesting people, suburbs are pretty dull. So I had grandmother lived with us, and I said, and we used to listen to this radio show called Grand Central Station, and it was really exciting, and they'd have the sound of trains going into Grand Central Station, and they would say, you know, da-da-da, da-da-da, and then it comes into Grand Central Station, crossroads of a million private lives. And I thought, that's where I have to go. I have to go to Grand Central Station. <laughs> so I did. I got on the train. My grandmother kept my secret, and I'm like nine years old, and she would give me money to call if I, anything got wrong. And then I would tell the trainman that I, was, I would take tap shoes and say I'm going in for my tap lesson, so he wouldn't think it was weird. And then I would get there and climb up to the balcony around the huge you know, room and watch the people. And I'd see you know, this man with a you know, slouched hat and a raincoat, and he'd kind of come up and start talking with a woman who had dark glasses on and looked foreign, and they'd talk and then they'd move away and I'd say, they must be communists. <laughs> <laughs> I'd write that story. And, so that was my, you know, I realized that I had to just keep going out there and discovering the world to satisfy my curiosity. Well, at the end of all of our, our interviews, as we know, we always ask the same question. I gave Gail a hint, which we don't is even give anybody a hint, so she will have some answer. We ask our lovely guest, and oh my gosh, it's so wonderful to be able to sit here and chat with you tonight, to provide for you all a golden nugget something that you all can take home with you, that's your very own gift from our speaker tonight while she shares with us. So I'm asking you, what is your golden nugget for our guest tonight? Well, I have this, I've already started to say this, but I think there's three things that will really help you to prolong a healthy life. One, the golden door. <laughs> Two, Rancho La Puerta. <laughs> and three, royal jelly. Have you ever heard of royal yes, jelly? Of course. <laughs> yes, of course. I know exactly what that is. You know what I'm talking I'm about? I'm afraid we do. Right? <laughs> of course we do. And yes, you're right. How many of you have ever heard of royal jelly? Absolutely. A bunch of you. Good. Not everybody, but you know. I mean, do you want to be a queen bee? Right? I mean, she's a little heavier than the male bees, but she is she has she lives nine times longer. I've been taking royal jelly for thirty years every morning. And I hardly ever, never had a serious illness, and I hardly ever get colds. 